in fact, programming goes beyond traditional mathematical theories. It's a new discipline of which each theory only highlights a part. So in fact, we're still exploring how far programming can go. There is really a jungle of programming paradigms out there. There are lots and lots of paradigms. So what do we do? How can we understand this jungle of programming paradigms? In fact, the kernel language comes to the rescue here. Uh, just as kernel languages let you understand the relationships between the different paradigms, we can use also the kernel languages to organize all the different paradigms. So one way of looking at a paradigm is a set of concepts organized as a kernel language, as a small core language containing all the important concepts of the paradigm. And an interesting point is that the kernel languages of different paradigms are related to each other. And it's very often true that two kernel languages differ in only one concept. So, for example, functional programming, we add cells, explicit state, and this allows us to define all the techniques of object-oriented programming. So these two paradigms, the kernel languages, have only one concept difference. So if we apply this principle in a thorough way, by looking at as many paradigms as we can and defining them in terms of their kernel languages, we can organize kernel languages into a kind of family tree. So here is, for example, one taxonomy. So here the paradigms are organized in terms of the core concepts of the kernel language. So we start with a very simple one. This is the definition of the functional paradigm. So this is the base. This gives you all the basic programming concepts that you need for writing programs. Then we extended this to object-oriented programming. So how did we extend it? Well, we added state. Another extension going the other way is again starting with the functional paradigm, but now we add threads. Okay, so we start with functional here. We have this thread extension, and this lets us write deterministic data flow programs. We have a fourth kernel language of multi-agent data flow. So we keep the thread extension. We then add ports, ports which are named streams, which are kind of communication channel. So semantically, ports and cells are equivalent. You can encode one in terms of the other. And finally, we have our fifth paradigm, active objects active objects which combine the abilities of object-oriented programming with multi-agent data flow. So the behavior of each active object is determined by a class, and object, active objects communicate by message passing. We have both paradigms, both ways of thinking are useful, are possible in this paradigm of active objects. And the kernel language of this paradigm is the union of the kernel language of the two component paradigms. And I leave that as an exercise for you to write it down. I don't know how many of you have ever met Dijkstra, but you probably know that arrogance in computer science is measured in na nano Dijkstra's. And he once wrote a, a paper of the kind that he liked to write a lot of, uh, which had the title, On the Fact that the Atlantic Has Two Sides. And it was basically all about how different the approaches to computing science were uh, in Europe, especially in, in Holland, and, uh, and in the United States. And there are many interesting, you know, in the U.S. here, we were not mathematical enough, and um, gee, in, in Holland, if you're a full professor, you're actually an, appointed by the Queen, and there are many other uh, important distinctions made between the, the two cultures. So um, I wrote a rebuttal paper just called On the Fact that Most of the Software in the World is Written on One Side of the Atlantic. <laughs> 
And it was basically about, because I had a math degree too, it was basically about that computers form a new kind of math. You can't judge them. They don't really fit well into classical math, and people who try to do that are basically uh, indulging in a form of masturbation, maybe even realizing it. And it was about that it was a kind of a practical math, that it was, the balance was between making structures that were supposed to be consistent of a much larger kind than classical math had ever come close to dreaming of attempting, and having to deal with the exact same problems that classical math of any size has to deal with, which is uh, being able to be convincing about having covered all of the cases. There was a mathematician by the name of Euler whose speculations about what might be true formed 20 large books, and most of them were true. Most of them were right. Almost all of his proofs were wrong. And many PhDs in mathematics in the last and this century have been formed by uh, mathematicians going to Euler's books, finding one of his proofs, showing it was a bad proof, and then uh, guessing that he, his insight was probably correct and finding uh, a much more convincing proof. And so debugging actually goes on in mathematics uh, as well. And I think that the, I think the main thing about doing OOP work or any kind of programming work is that there has to be some exquisite blend between beauty and practicality. There's no reason to sacrifice either one of those. And people who are willing to sacrifice either one of those, I don't think really get what computing is all about. C++ and Objective-C and eventually Java and C-sharp were followers. The small talk led them. The, these languages learned from small talk. Anybody doing Objective-C now knows that the syntax of Objective-C and many of the libraries come directly from the small talk world. Small talk ruled. It ruled in a way uh, that no other language could have at the time. Uh, it ruled uh, technically. There was a productivity enhancement. Capers Jones measured it at perhaps a factor of five. Uh, a team of developers could get an application written and shipped five times faster than a C++ application or a C application. And those were measured things. That wasn't just Capers Jones spouting off. He did measurements and he studied the way these projects went. A factor of five is fairly significant in our world. Smalltalk also ruled in ways that we're just beginning to grasp. How many of you, well, this is a Ruby conference, so I guess most of you aren't using refactoring browsers, but I am using a refactoring browser in Java, and I have a, a, a little bit of a refactoring browser for Ruby. I use uh, the IntelliJ Ruby plugin, which allows me to do uh, uh, rename. But in Java, I can do amazing things with refactoring. The thing about that is, is that the Smalltalk people had that in the mid-90s. Their browsers and their IDEs were immensely powerful. Uh, long before most of us had even thought of a refactoring browser. So small talk ruled in a whole bunch of interesting ways, and yet it died. Um, I was wondering what thoughts you had about how this relates to functional programming. Um, we've, uh, our team started using fun uh, more functional language recently, and, and we've become one of our kind of emerging themes is statelessness, um, which obviously often makes our design a little bit counterintuitive because you're taking something that if you thought about it in real world would often would, would mutate its state and you're moving it into a code design where the state never changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. The, the recent discussions about functional languages 
is really interesting in a couple of different ways. One is it takes on very much of that language jihad kind of stuff that I did. And almost everybody that's advocating a functional language, including Dave Thomas, uh, who was, uh, he, he and his people at Carlson did the original goodies packs for small talk. He's been a, you know, a huge small talk object advocate forever. He's, he now claims to be a sinner that functional is the right way to do things. And so everybody destroys objects as a straw man kind of a thing to justify why we're doing functional kinds of things. What I would ask you, uh, and in the, the phrase that you said, you are saying you are putting control back into the world, uh, mutability and things of, of these kinds of things. I would suggest that you are doing no such thing. You have built a mirror of the real world inside of your program. And because it's inside of a machine, it suffers from certain kinds of constraints that things in the real world don't. And what you are doing is you're trying to compensate for those constraints in the machine with the functional language. So a uh, simplest example of that, can you point a function out to me in this room? I can point out a lot of objects. Can you point to a function in this room in reality? 